Hi, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. We will get started in just a minute to give people time to log in. All right, we're gonna get started. I'm going to pass the mic over to our executive director, Laurent Huber. Thank you very much and welcome to this webinar on why cessation is a vital part of tobacco policy and a key component to a human rights-based approach to health. This event is co-sponsored by ASH, the Center for Tobacco Cessation and the North American Quitline Consortium. First, today uh, I want to remind uh, everyone that today's Earth Day and remind all of us of the negative impact of tobacco on the environment. From tobacco growing to manufacturing, consumption and post-consumption, the ecological footprint of tobacco is comparable to that of entire countries, something actually I did not know until recently. Globally, the, globally, uh, the tobacco supply chain contributes to about 84 metric tons of CO2 emissions. This is equal to the combined footprint of Denmark, Luxembourg, Latvia and Lithuania. So it's a reminder that by taking steps to reduce smoking, governments, in addition to protecting the health of their citizens, they also take a positive step towards protect, protecting the environment and the earth. But back to cessation, which is too often an overlooked measure in tobacco control. Uh, but as you probably know, this year's theme for the World's Health No Tobacco Day is commit to quit. And as a public health community, we really have prioritized population-based interventions, such as smoke-free policies, tax increases, um, uh, advertising bans and so on and so forth. And those are absolutely critical. But as we implement those policies and the numbers of uh, smokers who decide to quit increases, we too often have failed to provide adequate cessation support. Hence, we fail to maximize on the opportunity to use all those tobacco control measures synergistically. We really need to remember that the WHO CTC, the tobacco treaty was meant as a recipe and not as a menu where some policies could be implemented and others just overlooked. Uh, implementing all of the measures together will be the best way to reduce smoking prevalence and, and reduce tobacco death and disease. Recently, some of you may have heard so through media outlets, for example, reports that President Biden is considering a reduction in nicotine level in cigarettes to where levels where they would no longer be addictive and also uh, uh, finally stopping the sale of menthol cigarettes like the EU has done in other number of, uh, numerous other countries. And New Zealand, as uh, this one just released um, a smoke-free 2025 action plan that will also consider ambitious measures to reduce smoking prevalence to, to minimal levels. But that those policies are implemented, it's absolutely critical that they're accompanied by adequate cessation support. So before I introduce the speaker, uh, some very quick housekeeping issues. Um, the PowerPoints will be made available via an email that will be uh, sent to all registrants after the webinar. And if you have any questions and answers, you can type them in the Q&A box, which at least for me is at the bottom of the screen on my Zoom screen. And you can feel free to type them to a specific speaker. So I will welcome the first speaker, uh, Dr. Linda Bailey. She's the president and CEO of the North American Quitline Consortium. And she will present the latest data on uh, access and call to, uh, to quitlines, which uh, strangely enough has been dropping since our, uh, COVID started. Uh, Linda, um, the, uh, the floor is yours.
Linda, you're muted. There, sorry about that. I was doing my share screen and forgot to unmute, but uh, thank you, Laurent, and good morning, everyone. Um, happy Earth Day. I'm very happy to be with you here today. Um, and I just want to get this going. All right, great. Um, so as Laurent mentioned, I'll be sharing some data with you today from a report uh, that the consortium published last month um, in March. And also I'll be supplementing what we published last month with some uh, new information um, uh, that actually is, uh, is very positive information. Um, before I get going with um, the, the report, I did want to acknowledge my colleague, Katie Mason, um, who's the research and evaluation manager at NAC uh, for her work in doing the analysis uh, that I'll be presenting today. Um, you know, this is a slide that um, I believe most folks from the US will be very familiar with. Um, it shows smoking prevalence for US adults starting in 65, um, when we had our first Surgeon General's report on tobacco. And this slide through 2000 was published um, by CDC at the end of the 1990s. Um, when the CDC director identified tobacco control as one of the 10 greatest public health achievements um, of the century for the US. And he based that on the decrease in prevalence from over 40% in 1965 to under 25% in 1997. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this, the slope of this line may not be as steep as all of us wish it was and the tail is a little higher than we want it to be. But I think it's important to remember that we had this success because we implemented effective policies. Um, Laurent mentioned tax, uh, taxes on, on excise taxes on tobacco, incredibly important. Also smoke-free laws and also providing access to cessation services uh, for smokers who wanna quit. Um, however, um, sorry, uh, in 2020, um, although we've been seeing really solid uh, increase in quitting behavior in the US, in, the US, in 2020, quit lines experienced um, some significant decreases in call volume. Um, and uh, as the COVID-19 pandemic was raging in the US, um, uh, NAC wanted to explore really what's the impact, what was the impact of the pandemic on smoking cessation. Um, so the slide in front of you shows um, uh, a record of calls to quit lines through the national portal, which is 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Um, this data, this record is kept by the National Cancer Institute which actually developed and established uh, the national portal, that, that telephone line. Um, that phone line um, uh, transfers callers to their state quit line. So anyone anywhere in the US or its territories can call 800 quit now and be uh, placed in queue uh, for quit line services. Um, we use the record of calls to the national portal um, and um, published this data showing the call volume. And as you can see between 2012 and 2019, um, calls were between about 715,000 to about 915,000 annually each year. Um, and those are people who wanna quit primarily um, in the US. Um, uh, you, you can see that the annual calls were fluctuated somewhat, but were, were fairly high. Um, when we looked at the calls through um, all 12 months of 2020, we saw that the total for those calls um, was only 525,000, really a significant drop in call volume um, for that year. This represented an overall decrease of 27% when we compared 2020 with 2019. 
and 525,000 calls is the lowest call volume quit lines have seen annually since 2007. So um, quite a big decrease for us um, in call volume. Um, when we um, broke down this data by quarter, we wanted to take a little bit of a deeper dive. Linda, um, sorry to interrupt for a second, but it, um, it seems like the, um, the view of the slides is a little bit like if they were like uh, quite large. Um, okay. So some people are having a difficult time uh, seeing the entire slide. Uh, is there something I can do? Let me see. Maybe if you can change maybe the view to a, to a smaller. Uh... Smaller view, let me. Okay, thank you for letting me know. Sorry about that. Let's see. I don't think I know how to do that. Um, you could probably do outside of presenter view, Linda, if that works easier. Where do I find that, Gabby? So I would just hit escape on the slideshow. Okay. And then if you want, to, you could even just zoom in to the slides or um, just present from this view so everyone can see. Okay, great. Um, sorry about that, everyone. I'll just, um, I know this is smaller. Can, can you see that we, at all? We can see that, yes, that works. Okay, I, I, I'm sorry about that. Um, so we, uh, we broke down the data by quarter and whoops, wanted to look at quarter. Um, and what you can see here is that in the first quarter, uh, call volume decreased by about 6% 2020 compared to 2019. Look at the second quarter though, call volume decreased by 39% 2020 compared to 2019. And then in the third and fourth quarter, the call volume went down by 30% and then by 21%. We were really impressed that um, by quarters, you really could see that call volume decreases were mirroring um, the, the pandemic in the US, which um, had a little bit of traction in the first quarter, which is January through March. Um, March was really when people started thinking about wearing masks, thinking about not traveling. April, May, and June, quarter two, the pandemic really was raging in this country. And that's when we saw the biggest decrease in call volume. And then as we came out of the summer, went into the fall and end of the year, winter months, November, December, um, people were getting ready um, for, the, for the vaccines. Um, and I think, um, you know, there was uh, less uh, of a concern, less of an anxiety um, around the pandemic than we had experienced over the summer when the numbers um, of um, cases as well as deaths was so incredibly high. Um, we also analyzed cigarette sales data for 2020. Um, and this was data available through the US Treasury. It's um, their, their sales and their tax data. Um, the data, we look back to 2015, 2016, and what we found that there was a steady decline in cigarette sales in this country, about four to 5% a year starting in 2016. So 2016, 17, 18, and 19, we saw that four to 5% decrease in sales. In 2020, the industry had forecasted a similar decrease of four to 5%, um, but mid-year they adjusted that to an actual increase. Um, and when we looked at the sales data from the treasury uh, for 2020, what we saw was a 2% increase in sales of tobacco that year. So what impressed us was we had a steady decline of four to five percent for four years, and then we had an increase of two percent. Even though two percent isn't a huge increase, when you're expecting a four to five percent decrease, it's a change in a trend, and that's what we saw in 2020. 
Um, so taken together, we felt that this data really did um, suggest uh, that the pandemic uh, was the cause of the decrease in call volumes uh, to quit lines. And we also felt that research published on increases in drinking and tobacco and substance use um, that meant that the researchers who published the data attributed to stress and anxiety from the pandemic last year really seemed to resonate um, with our members of the consortium that um, tobacco users were very stressed out as were all of us last year. And it just wasn't a time where they felt that they could try to quit. Um, so, um, you know, we all know that quitting is something that's very hard. It takes um, a certain willpower and a sense of calmness in yourself that you can do this, that you can achieve it. Uh, you know, it's gonna be a hard thing to do. And last year was a difficult year for people to, to feel that way. Um, I wanna share some new data with you. And I hope this slide will put a smile on everyone's face. Um, the orange bar here shows call volume through 800 quit now for the first quarter of 2021. And as you can see, call volume increased in the first quarter of 2021, not just compared with last year, our pandemic year, but also compared with 2019. So there was um, almost a 3% increase in call volume compared to 2019. And there was a, um, uh, I think a 9%, let me just double check. Yes, a 8.9% 8, increase in call volume compared uh, this year, compared to last year during the pandemic. Um, most of the call volume increase came about in March of this year. And March is when CDC begins its national um, media campaign called Tips from Former Smokers. Um, in past years, not last year, but in every other year that CDC has done this campaign, that campaign doubles call volumes to state quit lines when it's in, when it's on the air. And um, so overall for the year, it's about a 20, it represents 25% of call volume to quit lines throughout the year. Um, and so we were very happy to see that the campaign was having real traction that it created a real boost in call volume for us um, this, uh, this past March. And NAC will be watching the data as it comes out monthly um, for the rest of this calendar year to really look at um, what happens um, with call volume this year. Um, you know, as we move forward, um, uh, we'll be looking at call volume, and we really have um, set a goal for ourselves to try to make up the 200,000 calls this year that we lost last year. Um, states um, have been um, meeting uh, with, it, with NAC um, and really talking about some of the innovative ways that they're trying to promote quitting uh, to their residents um, and also tying it to a COVID message that it's more important than ever to quit uh, because COVID is still around and uh, you protect yourself from really serious consequences of the disease if you quit. Um, so we have states doing that. Um, I also wanted to mention that at a state and local level, we are encouraging folks um, to consider using a new social media campaign that was developed by the Smoking Cessation Leadership Center. It's called iCOVID Quit. And I've put a hot link here to both the NAC report, if you're interested in seeing that data, and to the Smoking Cessation Leadership Center's uh, social media uh, campaign materials, which are great and which are free and which anyone can use. And we also are really looking forward to supporting as much as we can CDC's national campaign um, tips from former smokers and hoping that together um, we'll see uh, all of these resources um, increasing call volume to state quit line. So thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. And it's uh, positive that to say that there were like increased number of uh, calls. 
However, worrisome to see a 2% increase in 2020 of sales in tobacco products, especially in the context of a pandemic, which already puts such a burden on health systems and also because of the, uh, the impact of smoking on a potentially worse COVID outcomes. So um, our next speaker is Dr. Robert Totanis. He's the technical officer on social determinants of health of the WHO, the World Health Organization. And he will address the global non-communicable disease business plan and investment case for healthcare and as it relates to tobacco cessation. Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Laurent. Um, I'm just gonna put this on full screen. Uh, is that visible to everyone? It's okay? Yes, Everything's it's perfect. perfect. Okay, great. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Laurent. Um, it's it's uh, uh, really nice. Um, and I, I thank every I thank people from Ash uh, for inviting me to present uh, at this webinar. Um, I'm going to present on some of the exciting pieces of work that we have uh, moving forward uh, within the WHO, and this is specifically uh, with regards to the global NCD business plan and the investment case for tobacco cessation. So these are two separate products that we are current that are currently under uh, under production. So let me just start with with the. NCD burden and the need for investment. I think we all know or we are familiar with these figures uh, in that NCDs cost 41 million deaths annually, accounting 74% of all deaths. And we know that tobacco use uh, actually causes uh, at least 8 million deaths annually. And a lot of those people who die, die prematurely, uh, meaning these are people who are in the prime of their lives, economically productive, and had a lot of uh, contributions uh, to society, and 85% of these are from low and lower middle income countries. Uh, despite the staggering burden, we know that NCDs, uh, NCD programs in general, tobacco control in general, tobacco cessation specifically, is quite underfunded, uh, and they account for a disproportionately small share of official development assess assistance to developing countries, and of course, to just overall public health financing. They just account for such a small percentage of that. Um, we know that the investment into these interventions and the implementation needs to scale up dramatically in order for us to meet our SDG goals by 2030. So really we needed to come up with the narrative and also the advocacy tools. And of course, based on evidence uh, that we need to step up our, our, uh, um, these interventions as well as in tobacco cessation. Uh, I was involved in, in, uh, in this report released in 2018 by WHOs uh, called Saving Lives, Spending Less. And this original report uh, presented the return on investment and other figures for the 16 NCD Best Buys. And you may be familiar with this document, uh, but essentially we had interventions included in the analysis in the area of tobacco control, alcohol, healthy diets, physical activity, uh, cervical cancer, and diabetes and hypertension management. But basically, uh, this sets out the economic case for investing in these best buys. Um, and, and some of the key results that we found were, were actually quite heavily cited in, in advocacy materials uh, and actually helped simplify the economic case for understanding why NCD interventions, these NCD interventions should be scaled up and invested in. So we, we got that seven is to one figure uh, return on investment for these uh, interventions, which is actually the same for uh, roughly the same for tobacco control uh, interventions when packaged as a whole. Uh, we found that there's a potential to save 8.2 million lives and reduce premature mortality by 15% by 2030, and to gain uh, 350 billion US dollars in economic benefits because of these lives that were saved within that time frame. So I, I think it's really about having the right narrative in order to encourage investment and encourage policymakers as well uh, to put and prioritize these interventions. Now, one of the things, uh, uh, one of them, some have criticized that in terms of the interventions included uh, in this report, that we only limited it to the best buys. And, and that's something that, that, that we've heard and we, we think uh, also we're working on to, to expand. Um, so, Primarily, this is the reason why there's this spotlight uh, on tobacco cessation. We, we, we haven't 
that uh, tobacco cessation um, as a set of interventions were not included in, in the original global NCD business plan. And we, we know this, we, 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 we know that uh, tobacco cessation is uh, quote unquote the orphan area uh, in tobacco control, but a lot of people forget that it's still a cost effective intervention even within the Appendix 3 of the Global NCD Action Plan that WHO released, a lot of people focused on the best buys, rightly, but uh, also uh, forgot that uh, basically cessation is a cost-effective uh, intervention, is a cost-effective set of interventions, and that it's highly recommended. And, and we know that that scaling up cessation is, is critical to meet SDGs and other targets, well as Laurent and Linda have mentioned uh, other uh, tobacco control policies are certainly quite important. It's something that we should do. We shouldn't forget about cessation. One of the key aspects or key things that we realized or I've realized um, with tobacco cessation and other tobacco control interventions uh, is around the political economy side of things. So when you have uh, tobacco taxes, when you have uh, legislation, smoke-free policies, and the other, the rest of the uh, demand reduction measures, we always encounter uh, uh, huge resistance to implement these. And, and I think one of the key advantages with cessation is that it's completely within the the healthcare or sort of the health arena uh, within governments, and it's something that you have less resistance to to implement. And it's something that can be done. Uh, uh, more uh, more easily if the resources are present, and it's, and it's something to think about when we when we when we think about implementing this in different countries and and trying to meet that deadline and that SDG target. We've also focused our uh, World No Tobacco Day campaign for 2021 to uh, commit to quit, as as we all know, and we're putting the spotlight on tobacco cessation rightly as as a very very important piece of tobacco control policy. So what are we doing with uh, to change that narrative and, and to help build that narrative that, that tobacco cessation is uh, in fact something that's worthwhile and something that's cost effective. So currently we're, we're in the process of producing a, a global investment case for tobacco cessation. We want to set out the economic case for investment to implement tobacco cessation interventions. And we want to do this um, uh, by updating the uh, cost data, uh, having the updated effect sizes of these interventions, and, and having the scale-up patterns updated. Uh, we, as mentioned initially, uh, this was due to substantial demand for analysis of interventions that did not quite uh, meet the best buy threshold, uh, which included tobacco cessation. And we plan to release this as a separate product uh, by World No Tobacco Day next month. So just uh, just a snapshot of how we're going about this. We're following the established WHO methodology, um, WHO choice database on costing and uh, um, the methodologies within and with using the One Health tool. Uh, we have basically an overview. So what we'll do is we'll have uh, a costing of, of, of these interventions. We've included three uh, main interventions that the WHO is tracking uh, with regards to cessation, and this is uh, brief advice, national toll-free quit lines, and provision of NRTs. Uh, from the effect sizes of these interventions, we'll be able to estimate and project the number of quitters, uh, the lives saved, uh, the morbidity avoided, and the healthy life years gained. And from these figures, we will be able to calculate calculate the economic returns, basically the productivity gains and social benefits derived from these health benefits. And that's essentially how we get the ROI or the return on investment by comparing the economics, economic returns gained versus the program costs or the cost to implement these, uh, these interventions. So what are the other elements um, of the project? Uh, of course, we, we're going to have uh, variations on cost estimates based on targets and the level of cost coverage for um, specific interventions. We know that uh, obviously there will be some uh, differences and of course variations in the way countries would implement this. So we also sort of want to have a sensitivity analysis of, of how much impact cessation can have depending on the coverage levels uh, and the targets set um, by different countries. 
We also want to include other potential cost-effective cessation interventions when right now we don't have the complete data to have and make a complete analysis of a return on investment analysis. But we certainly do hope to have uh, costing and the studies uh, of impact by these other promising interventions. Uh, and this may include uh, M cessation, mobile cessation, uh, chatbots. We know that there are a lot of up and coming uh, health technologies, apps, um, as well as drugs uh, that are available in different markets. And I think uh, Martin will be talking about some of these later in his presentation. We also want to have and to uh, have uh, possible access to country specific figures of these estimates. Um, and we're thinking about introducing or also discussing categories of financing options or models. And this is still to be determined. I'd also want to mention uh, another complementary uh, product that our colleagues from, uh, from the UN Interagency Task Force on NCDs are doing in collaboration with the UNDP. Uh, they're currently also um, making a comprehensive methodology document on how to generate national or country specific investment cases so in terms of the complementarity of this work we have the global investment case that sets out the the, the, um, the narrative and the, the and the economic arguments to invest in this and if you have and if you want if countries want specific uh investment cases for tobacco cessation then they can use this document that will be produced by our colleagues as well. And I think this is also slated to come out within the next few months, um, but maybe in June or July of this year. All right, so just a, a wrap up of project timelines. Uh, the global NCD business plan is also something that, that we are updating. Um, so we're planning to launch it sometime in the summer, but the tobacco cessation investment case is something that we're hard at work on uh, and we're planning and hoping to release it by World No Tobacco Day in May. Uh, thank you. So, so that's that's it. Um, and just to reiterate, uh, it's it's really it's really a, a great opportunity, and and um, uh, it's ripe to have and to have the change in narrative uh, on on tobacco cessation. And we hope that we can help change that narrative and and do our part in in promoting tobacco cessation more, uh, especially this year. So, over to you, Laurent. Thank you, Robert. And it will be so extremely helpful for all of the advocates and practitioners at local level to have a tool be able to demonstrate their cost effectiveness of providing access to cessation. And just a quick note for those of you uh, who are attending this webinar who are not as familiar with the international lingo, uh, NCDs, we refer to non-clinical diseases, cancer, cardiovascular, chronic lung disease, diabetes, for which tobacco is the leading risk factor. The SDGs are the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The goals that were adopted by the UN are, become, are kind of the to-do list for countries uh, as they set up uh, very key goals and targets for countries to achieve and tobacco is included in it. And we measure in every country the prevalence year after year. Um, so those are um, uh, quite important for all of our countries. And our next speaker, so, you know, so Robert presented, you know, what will be a very helpful tool on return on, demonstrating the return on investment uh, associated with cessation. And our next speaker uh, will address the fact that actually how little has been done in that area and how much we still need to do. Our next speaker is Dr. Martin Rod, director of the International Center for Tobacco Cessation. Cessation is a visiting professor at NYU uh, School of uh, Global Public Health. And he will present data on global implementation of cessation policies. And we'll also discuss key points of a new joint cessation report that ASH will be releasing uh, for World Not Tobacco Day. So we'll get a, an update on that and how cessation could be quickly incorporated into COVID-19 local responses. Uh, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes, loud and clear, we hear you very well. Um, can you see the slides? No. Um, I thought I'd clicked share screen. Oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Yep. Can you see the Excellent. All yes. right. So, just trying to get my right. Good. So, why cessation? <clears throat> well, first of all, because cessation support is needed by the many tobacco users that are addicted. Secondly, because only cessation offers health gains in the short to medium term. 
thirdly, because cessation support is effective and cost effective. And then because low cost measures exist that countries could implement now. Addictiveness of nicotine. But by the way, all, all of the sources and references in this presentation are in the ash paper that Laurent has just mentioned and which you'll be sent. So most tobacco users are addicted when they're young and in mature markets like the USA and Europe, 60 to 70% want to stop. But in these countries, the population cessation rates at one year are only about 5%, so quite low. And many of course never succeed in stopping and die prematurely as a result. This is from the World Bank and these data show um, they're a bit out of date now, but the point is still valid. So the blue line is what's, that's the baseline. So that's what's happening with no intervention. The green line shows what happens if the proportion of young adults stopping, um, stopping sorry, prevented from starting smoking is halved by 2020. And then the red line shows what happens if adult consumption is halved. So the key point is, because of the long uh, time lag between smoking and tobacco use and developing serious disease, you only get short-term population health gain from adult cessation. You can see the very small difference, worthwhile, but small difference by preventing uptake, but a huge difference by promoting cessation. Cessation support can increase that 5% figure to approximately 20%, but even low cessation rates can achieve a huge population health gain. For example, brief advice given throughout the healthcare system would produce a huge uh, improvement in, in life years saved. And then final point here, cessation is one of the most cost effective of all healthcare interventions. <clears throat> this is from um, the 2019 WHO Empower report. Global targets for reducing tobacco use will not be reached unless current tobacco users quit. Tobacco cessation support worldwide remains low. Many countries still have no national cessation strategy. <clears throat> Excuse me. These are data from a survey our group did, which was published in the journal Addiction in 2017. <clears throat> we surveyed 172 countries and got an 83% response rate. So headline findings, only a third of countries have a, a, an official national treatment strategy. Only a quarter have a budget for treatment. Almost half offer help to healthcare workers to stop using tobacco. I'm going to comment on that in a moment. Less than a third mandate the recording of tobacco use in medical notes. <clears throat> and that I think is an absolutely key measure because if you're not even recording tobacco use in medical notes, you're not going to be doing simple things like brief advice. Just a brief mention of tobacco use in healthcare workers. This is a very old slide, it's old data, but look at some of the numbers. Um, 48, nearly 50% nearly of Slovakian GPs were smokers in 2005. But they are old data, so our group did a systematic review of the literature of, on tobacco use in healthcare workers. And I'll just give you the headline finding of this review, <clears throat> which covered 229 studies, nearly, <clears throat> excuse me, nearly half a million healthcare workers in 63 countries. The data were collected from 2000 to 2016. So the headline figures, overall tobacco use, 21% uh, of healthcare workers, but the highest rate, 45%, and that was in male doctors in low middle income countries. So even the overall rate is still high-ish, 
and the highest rates are incredible. Um, so two points about this. Uh, the last studies we could get data for were in 2016. So even these numbers are a little bit out of date and there are still very, very few high quality up to date studies. So this area is a very, very seriously neglected area. A few comments now about cost effectiveness. So I need to move, okay. So these are headline findings from our survey again. A quarter of countries had specialized treatment facilities. Almost half say they integrate brief advice into existing services, but we didn't define that. Less than a quarter have a national quit line and less than a fifth have national text messaging support. Uh, brief comments about availability and affordability of medications that will lead into my comments about cytosine. So overall availability of medis medications, not too bad. And um, obviously much, much better for high income countries and pretty good for NRT. Cytosine very low, I'm going to mention that in a moment. Um, and this is an estimate of affordability from our, our correspondence. And again, overall affordability, not too bad. But if you look at low, middle and low income countries, not too good. But the point there is that cytosine has a very, very high affordability. And that's because of its low cost. OK, it's a busy slide, this. So I apologize for that. But it's uh, a table showing affordability from a review we did and the affordability um, is using an, a WHO definition that an intervention was judged as affordable for a given income category of a country if the estimated cost per life year saved was less than the per capita GDP for that country and any number of one or better is judged affordable on that category. So hi highlight from this table is text messaging at the top an order of magnitude more affordable, cost effective than anything else. Um, brief advice, very affordable, and cytosine, pretty good. Cytosine is a naturally occurring alkaloid. That's the, the plant on the right. It's structurally similar to varenicline. It's thought to work by reducing the severity of withdrawal. It's been available in Central and Eastern Europe since the 1960s. So there's a huge amount of data on effectiveness and safety, and it appears to be safe. It's more effective than NRT, and it may be as effective as varenicline, according to a recent trial. And here's the key point. A full course of, of cytosine costs approximately 15 US dollars, uh, but it's licensed in fewer than 20 countries. Uh, the good news is that at the moment, WHO is considering uh, um, proposals to put it on the essential medicines list. Now then, if we can share the screen live with Ash, I'm going to demonstrate this affordability calculator. But to do so, I've got to... Right, what about... Oh, okay, um, we're in. Click to begin. Okay. Try again. Good. Fantastic. Right. So um, I showed you a table from the review we did of affordability, and we developed this affordability calculator from that review. So it is an Excel spreadsheet. Good which allows you to input, right, the, I should say that the data, the efficacy data are from the research literature, the salary data are from um, the World Bank, and the costs of medicines and healthcare workers is from WHO data. So you can select your country in this drop-down box at the top, Let's do Argentina. Click the country and it automatically populates the spreadsheet with uh, the data 
and the far right hand corner there is your affordability um, and just to show you that if let's say that in Argentina you can't afford one hour of a physician time it, an hour sounds a long time but we actually doubled the amount of time we allowed for uh, um, healthcare worker time to allow for training but I just want to show you um, so on the right hand side you've got 5.1 the affordability index and I hope to reduce the physician time from one hour to to half an hour and with luck yes it, yes it does it goes up from 5.1 to 9 so that's the calculator um, it's being updated now to try and get more up-to-date more accurate salary data but I've used this in the countries I've been working with um, on behalf of the International Center and it's proving very very useful so can we go back? How do I get back to my slides? Ah, if you good. just restart the share from your computer, you're all set. Okay, have you, have you got them? Can you see that? Not yet. Not yet. So what do I have to do? Share screen again? Yep. Yep. Okay. can't get the zoom image I'm, I'm clicking on zoom at the bottom but nothing's happening why not hmm Martin would you like me to just share your slides for you yes I th let's let's do that there's only a few more so this won't take too long that's thank you very much so, my Zoom screen has disappeared totally, even though Zoom's still open. So, um, we hear you perfectly well. So, it would be the next slide, I think. Okay, so. Article 14 slide. Okay, well, I haven't got the slide in front of me, so I can talk through that. So, so FCT Article 14 basically um, asked each country to develop uh, comprehensive guidelines based on scientific evidence and to promote the cessation of tobacco use. Uh, next slide, please. And the Article 14 guidelines contain, um, basically ask, um, explain to countries what they need to do. So conduct a national situation analysis, develop a national cessation strategy, address the issue of tobacco use in healthcare workers, record tobacco use in medical notes, and I've already commented on that one, and then offer brief advice throughout the healthcare system. So next slide. And this is from the Ash World No Tobacco Day paper. What you can do. So for governments, develop an official strategy, mandate recording um, of tobacco use and medical notes and actually do it. Don't just mandate it, do it. Train healthcare workers to give brief advice, help healthcare workers stop, offer text messaging and fast track the uh, licensing of affordable medicines, especially cytosine. Next slide. And for healthcare workers, ask about tobacco use at every possible opportunity and give brief advice to stop. And the COVID vaccination program, program offers an extraordinary opportunity to reach every, in principle, to reach every single tobacco user in the world and just give a, even a few seconds of brief advice will prompt some people to stop and have a huge population effect. So next slide, which I hope is called the challenge, a reminder, is it? Yes, That's it is. So just a reminder then, we're talking about more than a billion people using tobacco, 8 million dying prematurely every year. Every day an adult smoker continues to smoke, they lose three to six hours of life. So that for the approximately 500 million current adult smokers, 62 million days of life are lost every day. And many of these want to stop and need 
help. So the final slide, conclusion, tobacco cessation support is effective, cost effective and affordable and is one of the most cost effective of all healthcare interventions and is needed by the millions of tobacco users who are addicted and yet it is still being neglected. Let's work together to help them. Final slide with my contact details, thank you. Thank you, Martin, and you're being a very good point. I mean, as long as governments allow for the sale of a product that's defective, like cigarettes, which basically addict and kill those the users, uh, and if they don't, if, as governments do not provide adequate access to cessation, they're basically not really uh, protecting the right to health of their citizens. Um, so we have now, we're going to have some time for our Q&A. Uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes left. And uh, you can continue to type them in the Q&A box and you can um, uh, address them to a specific speaker. Um, so I'll have first, I'll start with the very first one, which, uh, uh, so I'll start with, um, with WHO, with that, uh, Robert, a question for you. I have an easy one and a difficult one. Uh, the easy one is uh, this uh, WHO report, when will it be made available and how can the uh, listeners have access to it? That's the easy question. The most difficult one is like, um, given the really that being such an underfunded uh, area of, of health and given that it's the leading uh, um, cause of death and disease, how do we address that problem and how do we encourage funders, uh, bilateral funders, to uh, provide more access to both tobacco control in general, but also cessation. Thank you so much, uh, Laurent, for those questions. And just to answer the first question, um, we hope to make it available by uh, the end of May. Uh, it will be widely published uh, through our official WHO channels, uh, as well as the World No Tobacco Day uh, page. I think that's coming up also uh, uh, with regards to that. So just keep a lookout for it, um, and hopefully we'll be able to publish it uh, by that time. And in case we, we do have or we encounter some delays in, in, in that, we'll be sending out uh, press releases and, and definitely um, uh, keep you guys posted when it's available and, and link to that. The second question, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, is, is really quite uh, difficult. And I, I think it, it goes through and it, it uh, it follows from what I was discussing earlier uh, about the narrative uh, around tobacco cessation. And for me, at least from my perspective, there's always been this, uh, this uh, perception that tobacco cessation is quite expensive. It's not that cost effective relative to the other tobacco control policies. It's not as sexy. It's not, it's not uh, something that's uh, really attractive to do for, for a lot of uh, people working on tobacco control. But we, we need to change and we need to remember that that uh, cessation or, or convincing people to quit is, uh, is something that's that should come from different angles. We should uh, have that incentive for them to quit by, by increasing the prices. We should make their environments uh, more conducive to quitting. And we also should have definitely provide support, uh, quitting, quitting and cessation services uh, that can help support that. Um, as to how we can sort of increase the investment and increase uh, the amount being spent to cessation, uh, for cessation, we hope that this upcoming document will be a first step uh, to change that narrative and to encourage investment. And we, we think that the approach really is to package it with the other tobacco control interventions as something that, that you cannot separate and, and something that would be more effective if done as a package, if you focus on all of these uh, interventions, the empower interventions, as we'd like to call them from the visual um, and, and implement them. Um, and, and that's really, I think, uh, where I'll stop. And I know it's a difficult question, but I, I think it's a start and something we can consider. Again, like a quick clarification, this report will be available in the six WHO languages, right? Because I know sometimes some documents are not, this will be available in the six languages, right? Initially, initially it will be in English, uh, but we'll, we're going to work quickly to have it released in the other languages in the few weeks after that. Right. So I, I mean, I can't promise that as of right now, but uh, in terms of the, the timing, um, that's uh, how we'll do it. Great, thank you. Um, a question for, for Linda. Um, um, 
have you looked at quit line calls and changing call volume by type of referral, specifically those who may have been referred by behavioral health providers or other type of, uh, of referrals? Yeah, we're, we're, uh, thank you for that question. It's a great question. And we're just beginning now to do that. Um, the data I presented was just a record of calls coming in through the portal. So that data is available very quickly. Uh, a few days after end of the month, we get that data. Um, the kind of data uh, you're talking about in terms of looking at referral is actually from the quit lines themselves. And we collect that at the close of the year. So we're looking now at, <clears throat> excuse me, fiscal year 2020, which is July, 2019 through the end of June, 2020. We'll have the first six months of 2020 data to look at. And um, NAC will be presenting that data in a webinar on May 5th, if anybody is interested in attending. And the data will be on our website um, after that, uh, usually by the day after. Um, one of the things we've noticed is over the years, we've been getting more and more referrals from physicians and uh, other clinicians to quit lines. We're not able to separate that out by who makes the referral, whether it's behavioral health or family medicine or another kind of practice. Um, but I can tell you that we've been getting over 200,000 referrals a year for the past several years. And this um, in 2020, that number dropped below 200,000. I think it was about 180,000. Um, but again, that data uh, will be presented May 5th. Uh, we're just finalizing all those analyses, but it does look like um, the, uh, the pandemic of course had an impact on people going uh, to physicians, um, especially for well visits. Um, and so there wasn't really that opportunity um, as frequently to refer people to the quit line. And we certainly saw a decrease um, in the absolute number. Um, if the person who's interested wants to email me, I'm happy. Uh, to look up that number and provide it. I just don't have access to it right now. So you bring a, a great point about people not going to, uh, to, to, the, to see a medical practitioner because of COVID, a fear of, of contagion. And that's where I think the point that uh, Professor Dr. Martin Ra uh, was a very good one is can we use uh, the vaccination process as a way to encourage to, to, to at least get the, uh, the, those administering the, the vaccine to ask whether the person is a tobacco user and then a referral, that would be quite, quite helpful. There's a question, by the way, for Martin, for you. And, um, so I'd uh, bring uh, a mix two questions. One is how can people have access to the affordability calculator? What's the best way to uh, access that source? And the second question is, and then how do we how do we facilitate a process of getting cytosine on the market so we have a um, cost-effective and effective tool uh, also uh, accessible to those who use tobacco? but want to stop. The first question we'll work out together, Laurent, but um, the simplest thing probably is to put it on your website so that we can then give people a link. Um, but I can also email it to anybody who, who wants it. Um, what was the second question? Um, on cytosine, um, how do we encourage your governments oh, to do Right. Well, the WHO has invited um, um, supporting evidence to put it on their essential medicines list. And that's very, very important because when a drug is on that list, it does very often get incorporated in, into a country's own list. So that's a very, very important mechanism. And it's fantastic that WHO are doing that. Um, that that's, that's the short answer really, because once it gets onto lists like that, um, you can often fast track licensing. So um, drugs that are on the European Union's list, there are certain countries that can then fast track that drug in their country. So that's the, the quick answer. Thank you. And so then I have a last question that maybe the three, uh, like maybe the three of you to address very quickly. And it's a question about COVID vaccination and whether, uh, whether it would be advisable to continue medication for quitting after first or second dose. And my suggestion, it would be that yes, given that the, uh, sin the negative impact of uh, smoking on COVID outcomes, let's do everything to get people to quit in any way we can. But I'll let the experts speak on that topic. 
would you advise people to continue taking um, cessation medication uh, if needed uh, to make sure they stop smoking? I, that, Linda, you're a doctor, aren't you? I, I, I'm not a physician. I, I'm not. I'm a lawyer, so I'm, I may be the worst person on the panel to ask that. I, I would I would suggest that people touch base with their physician or with their quit line for advice there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back, I, I just got vaccinated myself and I did get a list of medications to avoid uh, just before and just after vaccination. And I don't remember um, any cessation medication being on that list, but that's something I'd be happy um, to double check on, uh, Laurent, and, um, and to email uh, something back to you if that would be helpful. I don't know, Robert, if, if, um, if you know the answer to that. Yeah, I, I second your advice, uh, Linda. Uh, it's always uh, best to double check with your physician. Um, but as far as I know, I don't think there are any uh, uh, cessation medications specifically that's uh, not advised to be continued um, after a COVID shot. Uh, it's always uh, cost-benefit uh, analysis. And I think the benefits of smoking or the potential to quit smoking is outweighs um, any potential reactions, but please don't quote me on that. I'm, I'm not particularly sure. Um, always consult with your physician if, if, if you're unsure. Over. Martin, last words? Well, I don't, I'm unaware of any interactions, so my advice would be yes, keep taking them, but it would be prudent. Uh, we, we will look into it and, um, and get back to you on that, but it would be prudent to ask advice, I think. So absolutely, so check with your, your, your physician However, do take steps to smoke, to stop smoking. Uh, you would be a, a, you do a service to your health, but also as we mentioned earlier, given the impact of, uh, of tobacco on the environment, even for the environment. Um, so thank you all for joining. Please stay tuned for next webinars. We are uh, gonna have an, a very interesting discussion next week, uh, given that they will be after the, the uh, FDA will provide an answer to a citizen's petition uh, on the topic of menthol uh, and on, on phasing menthol out of the market in order to protect uh, African-Americans, but as well as uh, other smokers uh, from uh, other tobacco users. And so there will be a, a response by, uh, by the end of next week. So we are by next Thursday. So we will, we will have on um, um, a session on the topic. Um, and uh, on Thursday 29, there will be a, a live chat on the result of, the, uh, of, of, this, uh, of this action. So please stay tuned for those. Uh, for those. And uh, also uh, you feel free to obviously uh, stay, uh, follow us given that we, uh, we continue and we have regular webinars and sessions that could be uh, quite interesting to the tobacco control community and the health community. And again, a big thank you to the panelists, Linda, Robert and Martin. It was a pleasure here to have you uh, to have you today, and um, have a safe uh, rest of the day. And thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.